Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 33rd NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar. The goal of these seminars is to share examples of NOAA's leadership and impact in environmental science for our nation by those who lead it and make it happen. My name is Robert Levy, NOAA Studio Production Manager and member of the NELS team. I'd like to take a moment for a few acknowledgments and details. First, I'd like to thank the NOAA Science Council and the awesome team that I work with to produce these seminars. Sandra Clark with NOAA NESDIS, Office of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Katie Rowley with NOAA OAR and NOAA Central Library, and Dr. Hernan Garcia with NOAA NESDIS. Our presenters are NOAA's Assistant Administrators, and our moderator is NOAA Chief of Staff, Dr. Karen Hyun. Welcome, and thank you to NOAA's senior leadership. We can't wait to hear about your FY23 plans. Dr. Hyun, the floor is all yours. Hello, my name is Karen Hyun, and I'm the NOAA Chief of Staff. NOAA's mission is to understand and predict our changing environment and to manage and conserve America's coastal and marine resources. We are working hard under the leadership of Dr. Spinrad to build a climate-ready nation, foster the new blue economy, and embed equity in everything we do, internally and externally. The motivation of this panel of NOAA Assistant Administrators is to offer them an opportunity to provide highlights of their line office FY23 plans and how to support NOAA's mission to serve the American society. Each NOAA Assistant Administrator will first briefly introduce themselves and address two overarching questions. Hello, and thank you for hosting this important discussion. My name is Dr. Stephen Voltz, and I serve as the Assistant Administrator of NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. NESDIS, as the U.S. government's leading source and steward of environmental data and information, is crucially tasked with the end-to-end -end responsibility of ensuring the quality, availability, and utility of the environmental data and information that we and our partners collect. The data we collect, process, store, and deliver is foundational to the operations and the missions of each of NOAA's line offices, as well as supporting the work of international partners, of scientists, academia, the commercial sector, and of private citizens around the world for an ever-expanding range of applications and critical needs. The 24-7 global coverage provided by NESDIS and our partners enables continuity of data information and products. We are simultaneously producing the fuel, the observations, and crafting and maintaining the engine that produces the information products the nation and the world need. Hi, I'm Janet Coit, and I wear two hats at NOAA. I'm currently the Acting Undersecretary for Oceans and Atmosphere. I'm also the Assistant Administrator for NOAA Fisheries, which many people refer to as the National Marine Fisheries Service. Prior to getting here, I worked for over a decade as the head of Rhode Island's Department of Environmental Management. In that capacity, I worked for three governors, including our current Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Greetings, NOAA. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name's Nicole LaBeouf. I'm the Assistant Administrator for the National Ocean Service, or NOS. At NOS, we currently have over 1,800 staff in more than 50 locations around the country. My job is to oversee all of NOS's decision-making and operations as we provide science-based solutions to advance sustainable and resilient ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes communities, economies, and ecosystems for the benefit of the nation. On a personal note, I was born and raised on the Texas Gulf Coast, and I still pinch myself when I think of how far I've come to leave my hometown and become a marine biologist, and now as the head of our nation's premier ocean and coastal science agency. Today, as a member of the NOAA leadership team, I know firsthand the challenges we face, especially as we consider our rapidly changing world. We have our work cut out for us, but I know that NOAA is up to the task. I'm excited to be a part of today's panel. I'm here to talk about how NOS stands ready to address some of our nation's most difficult challenges and help accomplish NOAA's mission. Hi, this is Ken Graham, Director of the National Weather Service. I just want to introduce myself and introduce um, our agency, the National Weather Service. And, and the first thing I have to talk about is the incredible people uh, across the Weather Service. I am so humbled and proud to serve them every single day. You see, they're in the trenches every day issuing thousands of forecasts, hundreds of warnings. They're providing impact-based decision support to decision makers to make really tough decisions. They're on the front lines, eyeball to eyeball, in communities across this country and across the globe. 
providing that information. You see, it's not just the weather part, it's, it's, it's oceans. We're talking about fire weather, we're talking about tsunamis, space weather. I um, mean, think about hurricanes, you think about tornadoes. Look, if it's, if it's a bad environmental situation, the National Weather Service is there 24 hours a day to provide that information to save lives. You think about any sort of mission, any sort of mission that saves lives is one that creates the passion, a passionate workforce of people that wanted to do this since they were young. So I am so proud to lead this agency. The modeling, you think about the research, getting that into operations, you see it every day, making a difference, not just in the economy and saving lives, but making a difference every single day. People get up, the first thing they check is the weather, and we're there for them. Hi, I'm Steve Thur, the new Assistant Administrator for NOAA's Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. OER is also known as NOAA Research and is a world leader in understanding the complex systems that support our planet. I'm excited to join the talented OER team, which is working on science to address the largest environmental, societal, and economic challenges of the next century. With a combined workforce of nearly 2,300 staff, 10 laboratories, six programs, 34 university-based Sea Grant programs, and 20 cooperative institutes across the country, NOAA Research provides the science foundation to deliver NOAA's future. The work we do has never been more important to NOAA, the nation, and our world. I'm Admiral Nancy Hahn. I'm the director of NOAA's Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, and also the director of the NOAA Commission Corps, which is one of the eight uniformed services of the United States. I've worked for NOAA since 1996. Uh, most of that time as a commissioned officer, and I've also worked as a, on NOAA ships as a general vessel assistant um, and as a biological technician from a laboratory. And during the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to work on NOAA ships and aircraft and uncrewed systems and also in a variety of uh, field support units, including the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab, um, which has been a great opportunity. Could you please provide brief highlights of your FY23 line office priorities or roadmap? And how do these support NOAA's mission? We are at a major pivot point in NOAA and in NESDIS. Looking ahead, NESDIS, as is true across the NOAA enterprise broadly, must embrace and rapidly implement significant transitions and expansions in the scale of our observations and in the scope of our information services. This pivot will be felt across the agency, posing both great opportunity and great challenge. For NESDIS, this will mean balancing the continued delivery of critical operational services while developing and deploying infrastructure and products that meet the changing needs of our partners and our users. We are building connections across the diverse set of observational data collection systems within the agency, and we must continue to bring together NOAA operations with that of our external partners. To that end, NESDIS has significant programmatic milestones on the near horizon. This includes the launch of the Argos-4 instrument hosted on a commercial spacecraft and managed as an operational data service with no NOAA satellite operations involved for the first time for NESDIS and for NOAA. Our polar satellite JPSS-2 will launch in November from Vandenberg Space Force Base in the third of the Joint Polar Satellite System Series following the SUMI NPP uh, mission and the JPSS-1 mission. Two, f two further missions, JPSS-3 and 4, will follow, providing these data to NWS and others through 2040. Our GOES-18 spacecraft, launched in March of 22, will become operational as the GOES-West in January of 2023. And the fourth of that series, GOES-U, will follow in 2024. These satellites will be providing observations into the mid-2030s and beyond as well. We are today now defining and designing the satellite systems that will operate well beyond those systems well into the 2050s. Beyond the current generation, we have a major milestones for all of our next generation infrastructure and instrumentation developments. Our next generation geostationary program, GeoExo, will follow the GOES-R series. In December, the GeoExo program will reach its Department of Commerce milestone two. At this point, NESDIS expects to secure DOC commitment to the proposed architecture. This architecture includes five instruments and six satellites overall. Two of the legacy instruments, the Imager and the Lightning Mapper, will follow on the GOES-R series, but the other three will show how GeoExo will be our first all-NOAA geostationary satellite, adding observations for ocean color, atmospheric composition, and hyperspectral infrared sounding. 
This all-no omission is a recognition that we must observe and understand the Earth as a whole and not as a series of distinct separate processes. It was only in 2010 that NOAA was clearly assigned the space weather responsibility for the nation, many decades after our terrestrial weather responsibilities were taken on. We have been monitoring our space weather environment for a generation largely using borrowed research satellite observations. Our Space Weather Next program is continuing our work to stand up an operational NOAA space weather observing system. We're replacing aging research observations with NOAA assets and introducing additional observations and resilience into the system with multiple orbit points of view. NESA has and will continue to bring in observations from multiple partners, all to supply the Weather Service Space Weather Prediction Center with the information they need to provide space weather forecasts, alerts, and warnings. As a loosely coupled program, Space Weather Next will include projects with a series of observations from deep space at Lagrange Point 1 and 5, in geostationary orbit, and in low Earth orbit, both by building and launching our own systems, as well as working with partners for ride shares, for data access, and more. And in October, Space Weather Next will go before the Department of Commerce for its first Milestone 1. For the polar orbiting side of the house, polar orbiting satellites are essential for numerical weather prediction, and they provide a spectrum of existing observations across the board. In addition to the JPSS satellites I mentioned, our next generation quick sounder mission, approved in August of 22, is paving the way for a new observations approach in LEO. Quick sounder will explore a variety of possibilities, and taking advantage of recent innovations in the commercial aerospace industry, in small satellite technology and access to space, in communications from space to ground, etc., all known collectively as new space, in order to improve the resilience of our next generation LEO architecture and allow for rapid and efficient replenishment of on orbit assets in responding to changes in observational needs. Quick Sounder will move from concept to launch in less than five years. That's nearly light speed when compared to our typical 15 year developmental timeline for new missions. Bringing all these together, is the ground systems and data that have to be made to work as well. While NESIS reimagines and implements its next generation satellites, we also must prioritize the corresponding shifts in our ground-based systems and our entire IT infrastructure. Next generation computational data delivery and processing are foundational to meeting the future mission of the entire NOAA enterprise. Our National Centers for Environmental Information maintain the environmental archives for the nation and issues regular reports on the state of the climate and other issues. We contribute globally by maintaining data sets like the World Ocean Database, the Global Historical Climatology Network, and climate data records overall. It is on this basis that NOAA is the authoritative source for climate products and services. I think everyone at NOAA is aware that we're experiencing a climate crisis and the growing effects of climate change impact every corner of our science-based mission, from managing sustainable fisheries and aquaculture to conserving protected resources and habitats. As we confront this immense challenge, we're providing the scientific information, the tools, the capacity for resource managers and stakeholders to assess and reduce impacts. We're helping them to increase resilience and to adapt to changing ocean conditions. We need to understand what's happening with fisheries so that people can plan, adapt, and mitigate impacts for the future. This is really critical for our fishing communities and the millions of people who live and work along the coast. One pillar of this administration's climate change strategy is expanding offshore wind energy capacity in U.S. waters. While the Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the lead federal agency responsible for offshore energy exploration and development, NOAA plays a critical role. Our role at fisheries is focusing on minimizing the impacts to ocean resources, critical habitats, and fishing opportunities throughout the entire planning, siting, and development stages. We're working to have responsible and sustainable renewable energy and healthy oceans. In coordination with the other line offices, NOAA Fisheries is expanding our science capabilities. Ecosystem-based fishery management and climate science have greater roles to play as we expand our science cap capabilities to better understand evolving ecosystems and associated food webs. We're working to incorporate this new information into our management decisions. 
The changes we're witnessing now in the marine environment and its ecosystems require new methods of observation, additional data collection, and analysis using novel approaches in molecular methods, uncrewed systems, and artificial intelligence. NOAA Fisheries is engaged in multiple cross-line collaborations, especially with our National Ocean Service and Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Office. This NOAA-wide effort is critical to get where we want to go as far as new technologies that will help us address climate change. One top priority for NIMS is equity and environmental justice. I'm deeply committed to ensuring that we incorporate environmental justice considerations into our management and consultation decisions. This will take a lot of work. Taking into account the potential and the actual inequitable distribution of environmental costs and environmental benefits requires a deeper understanding of the social and economic implications of our actions. We will prioritize equity and environmental justice by promoting programs, policies, and activities to address the disproportionately high adverse impacts on disadvantaged communities. We have a strategy that we're getting feedback on and developing and implementing our strategy to address equity and environmental justice will be a top priority in 2023. As an agency under the Department of Commerce, NOAA Fisheries plays an important role in promoting economic development while also maintaining environmental stewardship. The fishing industry supports 1.8 million jobs in the U.S. and generates over $250 billion a year in sales. At NOAA, we're working to increase the competitiveness of the U.S. seafood industry to help make it more resilient to future market and environmental shocks. This work supports domestic production, sustainable seafood, and promotes jobs and helps ensure food security. We can be really proud of the way our fisheries are managed and we encourage people to eat our delicious seafood. It's part of maintaining their health and also supporting our coastal communities. In the next fiscal year, NOS is taking some extra effort to ensure we are pursuing the right goals and establishing effective strategies to meet them. NOS will publish a new strategic plan next spring in order to communicate and document these goals. The plan will help us concentrate our efforts and tell our story. It describes our critical role in filling important needs for our nation and for coastal communities. The plan will also be a framework for us to work together as a line office and with our partners to achieve our strategic goals and NOAA's mission. NOS is unique within NOAA given the wide diversity of missions across our program offices. For our strategic plan, it was critical that we leverage and connect this broad swath of expertise. This will be the first NOS strategic plan that has been designed to increase collaboration and information sharing across all NOS program offices, as well as with others in NOAA and with external partners. I am confident that this ultra collaborative approach will allow us to achieve greater impact. And we're actively gathering input from our workforce, our partners and stakeholders to ensure this new strategic plan keeps us on the right track to meet our evolving mission in a changing world. I've already held a series of focus groups that include staff from all NOS program offices to explore our core values and operating principles. We've also held workshops and visioning sessions with our leadership team, program staff office, and external groups. Just a few weeks ago, we completed a series of listening sessions with both external partners and our own workforce. While our plan is still under development, we have determined that it will focus on four key integrated priorities. First, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. This priority includes objectives that will help make sure that our services reach all audiences, including historically underrepresented communities. This priority also focuses our attention on how we can internally create and maintain a diverse and inclusive work environment. Let me take a moment to flesh out this priority a bit more than I will for the others. We know that the NOS workforce is our greatest asset, full stop, that's why we are taking actions to create a workplace that embraces and celebrates our passions and talents and fosters a culture of trust, continuous learning, and professional development. We've commissioned a comprehensive independent look at our hiring practices, workforce, and work environment. This assessment will evaluate our workforce demographics, identify any biases and barriers in our recruiting processes, and determine how we can make NOS a more welcoming and inclusive place. 
We are also creating a total worker health program to offer behavioral health and wellness science strategies and applications for our staff. I want to acknowledge my colleagues in the other line offices for leadership on similar efforts. Their programs have inspired us as we create our own holistic plan to support our workforce. The next priority in our strategic plan is coastal resilience. This priority seeks to broaden our capacity to produce equitable coastal products and services and to deliver them to those who need them the most in the face of rapid change. Our third priority is the new blue economy in which we will strategically support the knowledge and information-based blue economy, including where it aligns with equity, sustainability, and climate adaptation. Our final priority will be to conserve, restore, and connect. This priority revolves around NOS's role in advancing locally-led conservation and restoration efforts, as well as connecting people to special places along our coasts, ocean, and the Great Lakes. Developing NOS's new strategic plan represents an opportunity for us to refresh our priorities to more meaningful work across NOS programs and to track our progress. It also allows us to align with priorities in the departments and NOAA's strategic plans. In addition to the work that will be described in our new strategic plan, this is the time of growth for NOS even more broadly. We are playing a bigger role than ever within NOAA and the department as our expertise and world-class personnel and programs are being called to address some of the nation's biggest challenges. As we scale up to meet these urgent needs, this is a critical time to listen to our workforce and our partners and to support the entire NOS family by fostering diversity and inclusion and by refining our strategic thinking while not losing sight of the core NOS mission that got us here. Yeah, the National Weather Service Roadmap going into the future for FY23 and beyond really has three different focus areas. It's our people, it's our infrastructure, and our future. And that's resonated across the workforce as we really think about making people first. It has to be. Uh, so many people, my, myself included, wanted to do this since we were young, five, six, seven years old. And, and you really think about that passion and you have to take care of people. If we can do that, if we can do that, then we could really be uh, assured that people will take care of that, that mission. So we're looking at flexibilities in our roadmap. We're looking at, uh, you know, how do you make it easier with this shift work? Shift work's not easy. So making sure that we have those flexibilities and be able to, to be able to take care of everybody in that tough environment 24 hours a day, that's a big part uh, of our people initiative in that roadmap. The other part is looking at the infrastructure. You got to have a solid infrastructure going forward. You think about thousands of forecasts every single day are issued. Hundreds of warnings are issued. And some of those you really need to get out fast. Seconds count with this information. And I think if you think about enough infrastructure, you have to think about it from today and what's the next infrastructure that we're going to have as data increases. More information needs to be delivered. So we're looking at the now, we're looking at the future when it comes to that infrastructure from websites, to getting information to people on their phones and partnerships with other agencies like FEMA, being able to make sure uh, that information gets out quickly. And the last one is, is really looking at our future, looking at uh, the next big architecture, the system of the future. We're really striving for more portability, nimbleness, being able to deliver services from anywhere, not just the office, but being able to get to an emergency operations center and having all the tools that you would have in the office right there in front of you with these other locations. Eyeball to eyeball is so important in a disaster and we're striving for more portability. All of these, very proud to say, support directly uh, NOAA's mission. You think about the verbs that are in NOAA's mission. It's to predict and also to share information about a changing climate changing weather, changing oceans, and changing coastline. You think about that information, we're right there in the weather service, delivering those services. And if you look at where we're going in the future, we're directly gonna support that, that wonderful mission to deliver that information when people need it the most. Our science embodies NOAA's strategy to combat climate change through understanding the Earth system, including the forecasting of extreme weather and water events, and developing the technology that improves, serves, and provides valuable stewardship to a safe and healthy society, as well as a vibrant and sustainable economy. I'm going to focus my remarks on four examples 
of OAR's many activities that support NOAA's priority to build a climate-ready nation and how the President's fiscal year 23 budget request either supports expanding existing capabilities or initiates new climate products and services. First, to assist climate risk decision-making across a wide variety of stakeholders and economic sectors, the President's budget for 2023 would empower OER to develop accessible and actionable climate projections to enhance atmospheric observing systems, allowing NOAA to support global stocktake to monitor the implementation and progress of the Paris Agreement. This allows an independent and transparent evaluation of greenhouse gas emissions and the changes of those emissions over time at various scales. Our understanding of greenhouse gas emissions will be enhanced, further enabling NOAA to provide essential knowledge to policymakers limiting future climate change impacts. Second, Americans are increasingly vulnerable to severe weather phenomena such as wildfire, flooding, and drought, especially in light of our growing population and increased development in environmentally sensitive areas such as the arid west and along our coastlines. In the context of climate change, extreme events like heavy precipitation, floods, and drought-induced wildfire are occurring more frequently. In order to create a more resilient future, OAR, as part of an ongoing work and per the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, is developing a global, high-resolution, atmospheric model with a three-kilometer or below resolution to improve NOAA's understanding and prediction of extreme events on all timescales. We're also including an observational program that takes into account the boundary layer and clouds that will further improve forecasting skill for extreme weather events with accurate and earlier warning. Third, to advance climate change adaptation measures and resilience planning at regional and local scales while prioritizing environmental justice, we proposed a new public-private partnership called the Climate Smart Communities Initiative. This initiative would scale up and accelerate on-the-ground training, upping the pace of resilience-building communities across the nation, utilizing the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. The toolkit helps people find tools, information, and subject matter expertise to build climate resilience. The Climate Smart Communities Initiative will assist 20 cities and help address environmental justice issues within those communities. Coordinators will provide outreach and support for climate action engagement, among other high-impact activities, such as facilitating local climate mitigation and resilience planning, supporting development of local climate action and projects, hosting climate and transportation listening sessions. And fourth, no research is broadening tribal engagement through the National Integrated Drought Information System, more commonly known as NIDIS. To effectively address this part of a presidential budget priority, NIDIS, along with tribal, federal, and other partners, jointly developed the NIDIS Tribal Drought Engagement Strategy. Tribal nations will benefit from increased support to implement the strategy, which articulates specific actions and activities to improve drought observations and monitoring, prediction and forecasting, communication and outreach, planning and preparedness, and interdisciplinary research. These are just four of the many actions that OER is undertaking to tackle climate change, which in turn supports new blue economy initiatives and efforts. So in the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, we outline our priorities in our strategic plan, our five-year strategic plan, and it's built on three principles, and those are people, platforms, and culture. Um, as we support NOAA airborne and at-sea priorities with our ships and our aircraft, our uncrewed systems, and our NOAA commissioned officers, it's really important that we're in alignment with NOAA's priorities, and we've definitely met that in FY23. So in fiscal year 23, we will focus on people, making sure that we have a ready workforce in our five personnel systems, that they are trained, that we're adequately staffed, um, that we're preparing them to be successful as we execute NOAA's mission. Uh, for platforms, we are maximizing the days at sea, the flight hours, and the use of uncrewed. 
marine and aircraft systems to make sure we meet NOAA's priorities. So maximizing our days at sea, maximizing the capabilities of those ships and aircraft and uncrewed systems. Um, and then in terms of acquisition of the platforms, uh, we are bringing another new aircraft online in FY23. Um, we'll have two more in uh, modifications, and then we're working towards recapitalizing the P3 aircraft as well. So it's really important, and we've outlined that in our FY23 plans, that we operate the platforms that we have, where we continue to recapitalize with world-class assets. And then in terms of culture, that stretches across everything we do and is fundamental to support NOAA's priorities. So we work really hard on having a respectful workplace, making sure that everybody that's in our organization, as well as everyone that works in our workspace, whether it's ships or aircraft or our office space, um, adheres to rules of conduct and rules of respectful conduct that allow, enables people to do their mission, to do it in a safe way and do it in a sustainable way. So the work that we do on our people, on our platforms and on our culture is absolutely fundamental to execute NOAA's mission. And that stretches across the mission from hurricane forecast, tornado forecast, uh, fisheries forecast for recreational commercial fisheries, um, water forecasts, atmospheric rivers. It touches every corner of NOAA and informs the products and services that NOAA delivers to the nation. NOAA's administrator, Dr. Rick Spinrad, led the advancement of NOAA's FY22 to 26 strategic plan priorities to build a climate ready nation. Could you please highlight how your line office supports these priorities? As NOAA seeks to provide the products, services, and capabilities that will enable the U.S. to become a climate ready nation, NESIS's role will be twofold. First, to provide the global satellite observations that are essential contributions to our Earth system understanding. And second, to provide the essential IT infrastructure that underlies the services and processes of our line office partners as we all produce more and better climate products and services. The requisite shift in operational approach is really tectonic in scale. The agency is simultaneously in the midst of really unprecedented levels of both resource investment and mission expansion and customer expectations. The investments and the directives from the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law both enable and challenge the agency to meet its strategic goals. To meet these agency goals, we must take advantage of these once in a generation resource investments. And we must do this to meet the needs of both the nation and the planet. All of this is happening at incredibly compressed timescales. Sometimes unrealistic timescales enable us to have a freedom of action that is liberating. Our existing processes can't possibly meet the challenge. So we need to be ready to discard efforts and systems that don't work for us in this current timeline. These transformational investments and the growing mission demands of the agency overlap with challenges, needs, and opportunities within our workforce. This poses a number of specific questions for agency leadership. How do we meet these goals while meeting the needs of our workforce? How do we continue to bring in the diversity of ideas, of disciplines, perspectives, and experiences, and all the voices necessary to realize the agency's goals? How do we do so in both the short term and the long term? These are difficult challenges that the agency faces, and while we take steps to ensure the future of our workforce, much more must be done. At NESDIS, we are continuing to take steps to ensure that we are able to bring in early career professionals with the diverse sets of skills and life experiences. We also continue to center the health and vitality of our current workforce in these challenging times as we continue to listen to the needs of our people on their terms. Without them, we have no agency and we have we accomplished nothing discussed here today. The key word for understanding how NOAA approaches these crucial next steps is integration, and it is the key component to successfully executing on the agency's strategic goals. NOAA's pursuit of a fully integrated and holistic Earth system approach to weather, water, and climate into biology, chemistry, and human activity relies on NESDIS and our partners pushing new boundaries with its products, service delivery, and enabling integrated environmental system modeling and services. The integration of our collective Earth observing systems and their respective data is integral to realizing the NOAA wide strategy of an integrated and holistic Earth system approach to weather, water, and climate science, to services and stewardship. Our Weather Water Climate Board is a recently empowered cross NOAA body that is focused on just these cross dimensional efforts. NESDIS's role and ability is foundational in NOAA's push 
to strengthen its emphasis on integrated earth system science. We recognize the intrinsic connection between weather, water, and climate systems, which are linked through the hydrologic cycle and driven by ocean, land, and atmospheric processes. We also recognize that our role as the Data and Information Service places us at the center of the all-NOAA information integration. Our immediate intentions are to accelerate the movement of our 40-plus petabytes of data to the cloud and to create a cloud data infrastructure that supports NESIS and all other line office data and observations, as well as to continue to push for the research to operations for artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities, which are the front of and will color much of our future cross-line office engagements and partnerships. Bridging NESIS and other systems is only achievable through partnerships and the collaboration in the broadest sense. Pulling together the expertise, assets, and resources of federal and international partners, of regional decision makers, academia, and private sector collaborators are all key. No single discipline, no single line office, no single agency or even government will reach this shared standard on its own. NOAA will play a critical role in spearheading the partnerships, the conversations, and the systems by which this collaborative approach can become an implemented reality. We at NESIS have begun to take steps to realize this vision, and we are committed to delivering the products and services necessary for the world. NOAA Fisheries is an active partner in the agency's mission to ensure that we're a climate-ready nation. NOAA Fisheries has been tracking and studying the impacts of climate change and variability on protected species, habitats, fisheries, aquaculture, and ecosystems for decades. Our goal has been and remains safeguarding the nation's valuable marine resources and the many people, businesses, and communities that depend on them in a rapidly changing climate. At Fisheries, we're using climate science to inform management. A recent example is the development of a marine heat wave tracker. NOAA researchers developed global forecasts that provide up to a year's advance notice of marine heat waves, which are sudden and pronounced increases in ocean temperatures that can dramatically affect ocean ecosystems. These forecasts can help fishing fleets, ocean managers, and coastal communities to anticipate and react to the effects of marine heat waves. It's really fascinating stuff and it's practical because now managers can begin making informed choices and reacting to changes as they impact ecosystems. NOAA is engaged in supporting a new blue economy, and NOAA Fisheries is working with the private sector and across U.S. government to ensure that the growth of aquaculture in our exclusive economic zone makes use of the latest science, science that can help predict and adapt to ecosystem changes. The growth of aquaculture is part of developing a sustainable food system in America. Earlier I mentioned offshore wind. That's really part of the new blue economy in as much as it's a new use of our ocean that uses NOAA science around weather and forecasting and our efforts at NOAA Fisheries to make sure that offshore wind is appropriately and responsibly and sustainably sited in our vast ocean. From my very first conversation with Dr. Spinrad, he emphasized DEIA as being a top priority for his leadership at NOAA. We value a culture of respect where diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility are embraced and where all employees feel safe and valued. I'd like to highlight one example, the partnership and education program called the PEP program that was developed in the Woods Hole Northeast Science Center is in its 14th year of hosting students from populations who are underrepresented in marine and ocean sciences. They spend a summer gaining practical experience in the marine science. I met some of them this summer and they are terrific. We need more programs like this and we're expanding this program because we want to attract and develop the next generation of scientists. I've already provided some examples of our equity efforts. Now I'd like to focus on how we're using our expertise, data, and services to advance NOAA's Climate Ready Nation initiative and to advance the new blue economy. First, on the topic of NOAA as the federal government's authoritative source for climate products and services, providing the very best environmental information, products, and decision support is not a new endeavor for NOS. For over 200 years, NOS and its precursor organizations have helped communities understand their risks, adapt to changing conditions, 
and plan for a more resilient and prosperous future. Today, NOS is taking NOAA's lead for the Climate Ready Coast portion of NOAA's Climate Ready Nation efforts. We are enabling coastal communities to prepare for the effects of climate change through expert support, including translating our data into easy to use tools like the Sea Level Rise Viewer and Coastal County Snapshots, providing training and job aids for vulnerable populations, and enabling climate readiness, response, and resilience. NOS has recognized authority and leadership along with funding opportunities from both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act give us a unique opportunity to rise to the demand for our products and services and make a significant difference to coastal communities and to our nation as a whole. For example, we are working on data and products that will allow community managers to understand and anticipate changes in high tide flooding throughout the year. This information will allow us to transform how we predict and communicate the impacts of sea level rise, flooding, and other coastal hazards. Funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law is providing new and expanded opportunities for work that is critical to coastal resilience, including marine debris prevention and mitigation, habitat restoration, and coastal zone management, just to name a few. Several NOS programs were called out by name within the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law because of the decades of good work and services that NOS has provided. Because of your hard work, NOS is trusted to carry out these difficult tasks. We plan to use these new funds efficiently and effectively to meet Congress's tall expectations for us. Providing these resources to coastal communities is a key component of NOAA's work to build a climate-ready nation. Another important area where NOS is leading the way is supporting the new blue economy. So what makes the new blue economy different from how we've talked about the ocean-related economy in the past? The new blue economy stems from the idea that data, information, and knowledge about the ocean and coasts has value itself, including economic and societal value. By using that data and knowledge, we can spur public and private sector innovation and inform smart decision-making across sectors, resulting in both economic and societal benefits. One example of this ocean-observing value chain comes from the insurance and reinsurance industries. NOAA generates hurricane and flood predictions from not just atmospheric, but also ocean data collected by underwater autonomous platforms. Insurance companies use these predictions and data to generate their own models of storm damage and the potential for future losses. Their policies lead to choices made by individual businesses about what properties will be insured in the face of increased storm frequency and intensity. That's just one example of how ocean information can spawn its own suite of products, increasing our understanding of the significant role the ocean plays in the fate of our coastal communities, while at the same time managing risks, informing planning efforts, and allowing important commerce to remain prosperous. As many of you know, Dr. Spinrad, our NOAA administrator, developed the concept of the new blue economy. He has asked NOS to lead NOAA in advancing this idea. Like Dr. Spinrad, I firmly believe that we at NOAA are uniquely poised to accelerate and guide the early development of the new blue economy and revolutionize the way we use ocean information to meet societal needs. I'm looking forward to working across NOAA to advance this innovative thinking. You know, the National Weather Service, we're fortunate to, to be able to, to look at the, the priorities outlined by Dr. Spinrad. You think about these, these priorities. One of them is building a climate-ready nation. What we're already doing is such a natural progression towards looking at a climate-ready nation. In the National Weather Service, for years, we've talked about storm-ready. You think about that scale, storm level scale. We also have a weather ready nation looking at making sure communities are resilient and ready for the next big storm, not just on the coast, but inland as well, uh, making sure there's preparedness, there's activities associated with uh, training and exercise. It's all part of building a, a weather ready nation. 
And now we have significant efforts associated with a changing climate and looking at a climate-ready nation, looking further out in time, looking at that resilience and preparedness associated with a, a changing climate. People are seeing it more than ever. In my travels, talking to people on the coast, they see the sea level rise. They see the change and the, the frequency and the amount of the heavy rainfall that they get. They're seeing these things and they're mentioning it's not really like it was before. I don't remember this uh, when I was young. People are ask, asking these questions and we're there to, to really think about a climate ready nation. We're poised in every community at the National Weather Service to fulfill that goal of, of a climate ready nation. The other part of it is equity of service. Being in every community, the National Weather Service is uniquely poised to be in those communities, to talk about a change in climate, to talk about how people get information and in those services. We want everybody to be able to get those services because when the danger is there, whether it's a tornado, a fire, a flood, a hurricane, whatever it is, we want to be there in those communities to make sure everybody gets that information, to be have the information they need to make decisions about evacuation, make decisions about having supplies to get through the next storm. We want to make sure everybody gets that information. So we're uniquely poised to be able to do that in, in the National Weather Service. And the last part of the priority is looking at the new blue economy. Think about what we do in the Weather Service to support that, that goal. We have ocean prediction, looking at uh, ships that avoid the storm, avoiding is a big part of that information and looking at keeping people safe. You look at the Arctic, the ice center that we have in the National Weather Service, looking at this whole new world uh, and think about an economy and navigation, looking at the Arctic. We're a big part of that in supporting this big blue economy and we're ready and poised to look at it now and well into the future. There is a lot we're doing to support NOAA priorities in our climate, ocean and Great Lakes, and weather portfolios. How we are incorporating social science, using public-private partnerships, and much more. Please tune into future seminars. I'd like to affirm a foundational aspect to our research, which is to integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility into everything that OAR does. DEIA is one of OAR's stated four core organizational values both for how we want to function as an organization and for how our research, products, and services will provide benefits to society. Our goal is to increase our diversity and delivery of equitable data, information, and services. An example is how our National Sea Grant College program has impacted underserved communities in a small neighborhood in Norfolk, Virginia. A few years ago, Virginia Sea Grant provided $50,000 to a local nonprofit in order to develop a resilience adaptation plan for the Norfolk neighborhood of Chesterfield Heights. The nonprofit and Sea Grant engaged undergraduate engineering students in the design process. Then, those students presented their designs to the state of Virginia, and the state used them to secure a $120 million grant for adaptation planning in Norfolk. Think about that return on investment. $50,000 from Sea Grant, $120 million for resilience planning. This is just one small example of how OAR and our partners are prioritizing diversity and equity as part of our core philosophy. Our strategic plan in the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, which lays out our priorities for FY23 as well as the out years, are aligned with Dr. Spinrad's priorities of providing the climate data to the nation, uh, supporting commerce, and doing everything in an equitable and inclusive fashion. So some of the highlights uh, to support those priorities include uh, maximizing use of our current ships and aircraft uh, while we build new vessels and new aircraft and uncrewed systems to come online and support NOAA's priorities. In terms of commerce, everything we do ties back to commerce and supports his priority and NOAA's mission in supporting commerce. For example, our ships collect all the hydrographic data that's used for hydrographic charts, and that's the safe navigation in all of our waterways by recreational and commercial and military vessels. Uh, we collect the data that ultimately informs fishery quotas for commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, we collect the data that's used for hurricane forecasts, and that's really important from a commerce perspective to make sure that we're evacuating the right citizens, the right businesses, you know, if we have to close oil field production and refinement, that we're doing that in the most responsible 
way. So everything we do ties back to supporting the initiative of commerce while protecting our environment in a sustainable fashion. And then equity and inclusion is absolutely paramount to our mission. It's one of the three pillars in our strategic plan. We're really thoughtful about the way we're recruiting across our five personnel systems. So our civilians, our professional mariners, our NOAA Corps officers, uh, seeking to recruit in different populations that we haven't before, um, different schools, different organizations, and trying to connect with the American public as a whole and bring in people into our workforce that represent the American public to make sure the products and services that we deliver um, are representative of the information that we need. So his three priorities of climate, commerce, diversity and inclusion inform everything that we do in terms of how we operate the assets we have now and how we look to the future to staff those assets, um, to prepare future generations and to deliver the products and services to the nation. We are at the advent of building a true global climate observing system. In the past, we have developed great systems of excellence in weather forecasting, fisheries management, climate research, coastal zone management, and they have excelled individually and separately. Our new system will bring all of these together into an interconnected and interdependent climate observing system, combining NOAA and partner assets, and integrating these once disparate systems and models in a manner that allows us to understand impacts and changes in our intertwined climatic and ecological systems in ways never previously possible. This is the possibility and the potential that truly excites me every day. I am so impressed with the dedication and smarts of our NOAA workforce. It's truly a privilege to be part of this team. We have so much work to do, and it's so consequential and important to America. I look forward to working with the rest of NOAA and all of our partners on these critical issues. It's really an exciting time. I could not be more pleased and excited to work across NOAA with all of the NOAA leadership team as we face these challenges together, more integrated and more collaborative than we've ever been. It's been interesting in my career in, in the National Weather Service for 28 years, starting off as an intern and seeing my world just around uh, that, that forecast office and, and being a, a meteorologist in charge for so many years, seeing that, that community. So you start seeing a, a state level, you start seeing a region level. And, and then it was a unique vision uh, being from the National Hurricane Center, being the director there, seeing a much larger picture and seeing what NOAA does across the board uh, from the, the National Ocean Service, you see fisheries, you see um, NESDAs, you think all of NOAA, you become so proud seeing it from that level and going through uh, big storms. Um, I've seen everybody in NOAA come together. Going through Deepwater Horizon was probably the, the biggest event that I've ever seen and I saw across the board the passion, the, the mission delivery and the importance of every line office across NOAA and I was so proud to be a, be a part of that and now as director of the National Weather Service I see it again so clear um, uh, across the, all the line offices, not just the Weather Service but all the line offices. You have a view of the passion, you have the view of the impact that NOAA has, not just on our communities and the country, but across the, the world. And I, I can't describe how proud I am to be a part of this NOAA team. I look forward to getting to know many of the OAR team in the coming months. And I'm really looking forward to working in partnership with the other assistant administrators on this panel. Thank you for your support of the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series and your time. I look forward to my next opportunity to speak with you as OAR's Assistant Administrator when I can go into much greater depth about how NOAA research provides tremendous value to NOAA and our society as a whole. The Office of Marine and Aviation Operations stretches across NOAA's full portfolio, so we touch all corners of the portfolio. We fly the instruments, for example, before a satellite is launched and those instruments are placed on a satellite. Um, we fly to calibrate the data off those satellites while they're flying and make sure that they're accurate. So our ships, our aircraft, our uncrewed systems, and our NOAA Commission Corps um, really enable the NOAA science and make sure that we're meeting those prioritized requirements in a sustainable way. So I'd encourage everyone to you know, look at the products and services that you use every single day. Think about where that data came from. Think about how it informs your life, both recreationally, um, professionally, and from a safety perspective, and seek to understand more about NOAA's role in that, in that daily mission that you have. In closing, I wanna thank our NOAA assistant administrators for their leadership and talking with us. Now I will turn over the mic to Rob Levy. Thank you, Dr. Hewn. 
And thank you to NOAA's senior leadership for sharing your plans with us. We will have many more seminars in FY23 with a terrific list of presenters. Please tune in. We thank everyone for joining us today.